And we are live. Uh, this is the uh, Social Services Committee. Uh, attendance has been noted by the clerk. We do have quorum. Uh, I'd just like to read the rules of procedure here. Uh, I would like to remind members of committee, staff, and reviewing public of the electronic participation policy for hybrid meetings. For staff and delegates joining electronically, please keep your video and microphones off until requested by the chair, members of committee. All rules for the delegations are under the city's procedural bylaw and they continue to apply. The full corporate policy number 50 regarding virtual participation meetings is available online to review. And in the event that we have a service interruption or a connection issue that occurs that affects quorum, uh, we'll recess for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. Uh, are there any declarations of conflicts of interest for any of the items appearing today? Seeing none, we'll continue on. Uh, can I get a mover and a second to place all items for consideration set on the floor? Moved by Councillor Vanderstelt, seconded by Councillor Antosky. Are there any other items that the committee wishes to separate? Going to the room first and then online, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, possibly 5-1. <laughs> possibly. Um, unless I can get, I was gonna say, unless I can get my question in during the presentation. Um, Five three and five five. And I don't wish to go into great detail discussion on either from my end. I just have a couple of things I'd like to add, but I, I need them separated, I guess, to, to get yeah, those points in. So no, no problem. So five one, five three, and five five. Correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. So we will vote on five two and five four. I will all call. I will now call the uh, vote on all items not separated. All those in favor, and that is unanimous. Okay. Uh, there are no delegations. We have one presentation. We'll have the presentation happen now, and then we can get to questions when it comes up for vote. So I'll ask Marlene Miranda, General Manager, Community Services and Social Development, uh, Susan Van, uh, Susan Evenden, I always wanna say Van Evenden, sorry about that, Susan, uh, Director of Housing and Homelessness, to come forward to provide a presentation regarding 5.1, the CSSD vision plan. You may begin. Good morning, through the chair, Marley Miranda, General Manager, Community Services and Social Development. Uh, thank you today for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Uh, we are excited to present uh, the CSSD or Community Services and Social Development vision, which sets the stage for the next 10 years. Both the County of Brant and the City of Brantford are growing rapidly, and with that comes increased demands for services and programs. We find ourselves in a very different world post the global pandemic and with economic uncertainty, and when services and supports are needed more than ever for all ages and life situations. The vision and plan is about making life better every day for our communities. Um, um, for our communities. Is share, um, is share, this plan is shared today uh, to the committee as CSSD is the consolidated municipal service manager for both the city and the county and shares services including homelessness, prevention and response, child care and early years, emergency financial assistance, affordable housing and, and stability supports, which are jointly funded by both the municipalities and the province. Additionally, the commission has the vision um, plan, which includes uh, recreation, events, and social planning for the city of Brantford. The vision will be shared at council later this month. The CSSD vision, Making Lives Better Every Day, is a guide with three themes and priorities, which Susan will speak to, and it will be nimble and flexible to guide CSSD over the next 10 years for both the city and the county. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sue for taking the lead to pull this vision together with all of the stakeholders. I'll turn it over to Sue now. Good morning, Susan Evenden, Director of Family and Income Stability. Not Van Evenden that I know of, but anything's possible. Um, the vision that you're seeing in front of you when I get there, sorry, new technology. Um, in 2021, you may or may not have seen this, we did have a staff group that um, created a vision statement and values. Oh, 
Oh, no, I've got it. <laughs> Um, a little sensitive, um, and values. And so uh, these vision and values really align completely with the work that, that we did on the vision plan, because really what this vision and values that staff created speak to the how, um, and what you have before you is really about the what over the next 10 year horizon. In terms of process, uh, I do want to acknowledge the leadership of uh, Marlene, our general manager, as well as Brian Hutchings, our executive sponsor, and all of the staff in CSSD, and of course, our wonderful communications department uh, that produced the materials that you see in front of you. Um, in the vision plan, you won't see a whole lot of new surprising material because really it's drawn from your work, for one thing, from the city uh, priority count of council, as well as the county strategic plan and a number of other plans that are outlined in the report. Uh, we also have took a look at trends, jurisdictional scan, what are some promising practices out there, um, and engaged with some of our um, some of our key informants. And from that work, we were able to elicit three themes um, and the and an overarching purpose that Marlene has spoken to, building better lives every day. And this will really guide our work. So the, what you see on the slide in front of you are the four um, priorities under the theme of safe and vibrant places. We know, uh, and I, I have no need to tell this committee about the importance of place, um, but if we think of the story uh, from the uh, vision plan of Kylie, um, um, you can see how that would play out for her if we accomplish our vision. Um, she wasn't safe where she was living. Um, she needed to find somewhere to go immediately. Um, and she could thrive in a form of supported housing that doesn't actually exist in our community right now, but we imagine it could um, if she had a geared to income unit surrounded by supports to help her achieve her dream of a post-secondary education and a better life for herself and her child. Um, so that's one of the gaps, supported housing that we have, and there are many, as you're aware, um, in our housing continuum. And it's a serious priority, both for us as a department and we know for, for you as uh, counselor. Um, we also want to look at how we deliver service um, and do so in a more modernized way that's tailored to people's needs. Um, and in Kylie's case, that meant that she was able to walk to a service point in her neighborhood um, during the time when her partner was at work, and that was incredibly valuable for her. So we really want to transform that in-person experience, but also build on the channels that we already have in place for people um, that came through the pandemic, such as digital um, text and online options. The city and the county have an abundance of indoor and outdoor spaces. Some are underutilized. So we'd like to see ourselves working with the community to animate those spaces and encourage better use and more use by the community. Another of our critical um, objectives on this slide is enabling residents to optimize their health and well-being. Um, and this is actually a complex undertaking and given that many of the health services that our, our residents rely on are really responsibility of the federal gov or the provincial government and our health agencies. Um, but we do believe, and this is backed up by research, um, that it is a uh, better outcome if we can bring health and social care closer together, if not integrated, then closely coordinated. So this could make a huge difference for someone like Kylie if we have those connections. Um, then staff can connect her immediately to primary health care for her prenatal care um, and also to addictions care um, and additional health services. Um, after she delivers her son, Again, very important for her to be connected to services that will uh, be able to identify any concerns with Aiden's development, uh, be able to access early ons, um, recreation programs and subsidies. And lastly, um, we certainly uh, know that in our complex world, we really don't accomplish anything alone. Uh, we partner with other orders of government, city and county municipal departments, nonprofits, grassroots organizations, and these are key enablers of our work. And we do that already, but we can see, given the pressures uh, that the report and Marlene spoke to um, in the coming years, we really do need to deepen our part existing partnerships, and we have to look to innovate and build new partnerships to deliver on the priorities in this plan. 
So we're excited about the future and continuing with the great privilege that we have to serve our residents. And I want to thank the committee on behalf of our staff for your support ongoing of the work that we do. And also to acknowledge that we all share the common vision, um, I believe, of making life better every day for the citizens of Brantford and Brant. And so we're happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Councillor Miller, your first in queue. We have about three minutes left before this part of the agenda is done. So if you'd like to ask your question now, and then I'll have folks in the room if uh, they raise their hand. Okay, I appreciate that, Chair. Uh, okay, a couple of questions. Just one, uh, what precipitated this 10-year plan? Did the previous plan expire? That's the first question. So through the chair, um, there were some changes to the structure uh, just prior to my arrival um, with the commission. Um, and we did um, incorporate um, some of the recreational programming. And there really, I don't under believe there was a plan. There was a need just to structure what the guidance and uh, the vision was moving forward. Uh, so that's why we have the plan before you today. You're on mute, Councillor Miller. Yes, um, I think it's always good to have a plan. So I appreciate that. Um, and I just want to say, I, I like the work that's gone into it. I like I like the the what, um, they explain the why. I just have a couple questions around the the how. I guess that's our, our job as counselors. Um, and one of the questions was, um, there's no financial implications. To me, it seems like there's there's a bit of a, a bit of an increase in the in the responsibilities that uh, social services would be looking at. And I'm just wondering how. Um, do, 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 do you not see that as impacting uh, us financially? So through the chair, um, there are increased responsibilities. Um, many of our services that we provide are mandated by the province. Uh, so the funding will continue to be allocated and we will continue to stay within the funding envelope that we are issued through the province and through the joint cost sharing agreement between the city um, and the county. The additional responsibilities that are within the commission, if I understand your question, uh, with recreation and events um, and the social planning, um, is this is city funded and will continue to be city funded? Okay, I'll leave the other two questions till till five point one of the report. But uh, I, she did a very good job, Mr. Chair. She really she identified exactly what I was asking, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, and that was just in time. Um, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, much appreciated. I, I just wanted to note, if possible, that. Uh, uh, we had conversation at this table, Councillor Howes, Councillor McCreary, um, and uh, a few other folks were chatting about uh, something like a jobs table. Um, and uh, we talk about partnership in this uh, CSSD vision. Um, so I met with uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, CAO uh, or CEO, David Prang. Uh, Councillor McCreary presented a little bit about that discussion at the last chamber meeting we're both liaisons to, uh, and they seem very interested in helping with this. There are some parallel processes going on right now, but looking at, um, we discussed the ability to look at bringing employers in, both our transit systems, uh, as well as um, social services and community services from both communities. Uh, and ways we can help at least with the employer employee piece and some value add for local employers. So I just wanted to bring that up here because it's, it's relevant. So that discussion from last month, there is uh, movement on that occurring. So uh, we'll move to uh, items for consideration. Um, so we do have three separated items. Um, just a reminder that uh, all items separated have two speaking opportunities for each member of the committee at four minutes each. Um, now, can I get a clarification from the clerk? Um, Councillor Miller said that uh, he'd like to ask more questions. Is this time for questions or? If the item is on the floor, it's open for debate. And if there's questions of staff, he's welcome okay. to ask questions of staff. Just want to make sure just because it's a discussion. So, okay, thank you. Um, so 5.1, the CSSD vision plan. Um, let's see, let's uh, get it on the floor if somebody would like to. It's, it's already been placed on the oh, floor. Oh, sorry, it has already been placed on the floor. Uh, apologies. Um, so if there's discussion, we'll go with uh, anybody in the room first. Councillor Wall. Thank you for the presentation. It was amazing. Um, I guess I have some maybe practical questions regarding like administrating, uh, administering the services. So in this plan, does it go into detail about 
like I understand that you receive a lot of intake calls or a lot of calls coming in for support and not everybody can get responded to immediately. And people sometimes have to leave voicemails and wait for a call back or a lot of correspondence is done by email. And I know that when COVID hit, a lot of appointments stopped necessarily being in person and we moved to doing more like digital appointments. So the two questions I have would be, is there anything in the 10 year plan to talk about how we can expedite service requests uh, or support to staff like customer service support, I suppose, or whatever. And then also making appointments or meetings more accessible through things like Zoom. So through the chair, I'll start um, to answer the question and then I'll turn it over to Susan. So as far as the expediency uh, related to uh, response time, um, you can appreciate that uh, Maria and communications are working on a customer service and we're actively involved in those conversations. Uh, so we will be working with communications to, to work through a better response time and just to provide better customer services for all those that we serve. Um, and as far as uh, making appointments more accessible, uh, we are uh, bringing clients and residents back into the office to do in-person uh, meetings. Uh, and I'll ask Susan just to speak of any other technologies, if there is any. Yes, uh, through the chair, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that's actually, uh, one, it is a priority and a focus uh, that we've built out in this plan that we'll be working on, um, you know, immediately and moving forward. Um, absolutely, they, I think what we've learned from COVID is that our residents have been very adaptable to, um, you know, different ways of connecting with our service. But because of the nature of our service, we always have to have um, as many channels as we possibly can to meet the needs of residents. And so we are happy um, to be able to have in person and, you know, as we spoke about a little bit in the presentation, hopefully embedding um, in many neighborhoods in the city and the county. And so we're starting that with the county uh, Cowan Health Hub. Um, and just to put a plug in there, hopefully many of you can come to the opening next week on Thursday. Um, and the uh, idea would be both in the city and the county to have more access points for some face-to-face -face interaction where needed um, and get away from kind of a, a fully centralized in the downtown of Brantford kind of approach, but also to leverage the, the digital tools um, that we now have and that people are using very successfully. So it will be a mix. Thank you. Good answer. Uh, anything else, Councillor Roll? Excellent. Excellent question. Excellent answer. Uh, I will reset. Uh, anybody else in the room? Mayor Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I don't have a question, but I have a comment. And it's one aspect of the program will be a focus on children. In fact, the section is titled, Children and Youth Will Receive a Great Start in Life Through a Mix of Universal and Targeted Investments. And what I wanted to say is that that is um, very critical. There's a lot of research that's been done over the last several years and a body of research long before that, that demonstrates when you're dealing with social issues, let's such, such as substance abuse, that the pattern of substance abuse often begins in the teenage years and often done as an adaptive mechanism, either adapting to mental health issues, undiagnosed and untreated that the young person has, or they've had trauma in their life, and it's the substance that gives them relief from that pain. And then it becomes ingrained. And then if you try and deal with that once they've reached adulthood, it's much more ingrained, that coping mechanism of using substances and much more difficult to treat. So the allocating resources, time and effort, focusing on youth will over time, I think, pay great dividends when you are dealing with some of the greater social issues that we're dealing with as a community. And so I fully support this being part of the mix and the overall program, and certainly would support any initiatives that uh, would expand that. I mean, all parts of the program are very useful, but that one in particular has impacts well beyond simply providing youth with um, some assistance and pays dividends uh, into the future. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Davis. Yeah, the, the, the research is very clear. A, a dollar of uh, uh, upfront spending can save you know, upwards of $8 later in other systems. So absolutely. Uh, anybody else in the room? Okay, so we'll go to Councillor Antosky and then Councillor Sless. Councillor Antosky, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm going to use Kylie, um, Kylie's story as an example um, when we talk about partnerships in the community. It's my understanding that uh, Why Not has purchased a house and it's going to be specifically for um, young pregnant women. Is this the kind of thing that we would be looking at where we could partner and offer some, some wraparound services and, and they would also be able to tap into kind of the intake process for this specific need? Is, is this a good example of that? Through the chair, thank you for the question. And well, I don't have a lot of familiarity with that specific project, I have heard that that's uh, an in intent um, of that organization. And I think that is a beautiful example of how, um, you know, if there are uh, services that they're providing and potentially, um, you know, there are examples in other communities where short term, um, you know, sheltering is also provided, um, that would be an excellent um, complement, I think, to the work uh, that we would be doing with an individual in that circumstance and a resource that we would want to partner with. Okay, great. I, I hope that, that uh, we can find a way to get connected because they've bought the property. It's a beautiful property. And, and uh, I think any way that we could work together to, to help that succeed would be great. Thank you for a great report. Thank you, Councilor Antosky. And just add to that too, if we look at uh, the other report on Trillium Way, the idea that we're partnering with other agencies where units for agencies is a good example of um, action from the vision immediately uh, uh, relevant and applicable. Uh, Councilor Celeste and Councilor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, uh, can you help me answer the, the inquiries I get constantly from folks that say, what are you folks doing to help and get these folks that are downtown sleeping on the sidewalks and whatnot off the sidewalk and into something that uh, will get them on their way and, and, and get them uh, living a more productive life? Uh, is that covered in this report? I, I really didn't see how we're, uh, how we're reaching out to these folks that are highly visible and uh, are, are, are a cause, I guess, of a lot of discussion within the community. So through the chair, um, that is covered in uh, the plan and it's work that's already well underway and um, very active um, in responding and supporting um, those members. Um, but I'm gonna ask Trish to speak to some of the work that's being done. Uh, thank you, Trisha Givens, Director of Housing and Homelessness. So in regards to uh, supporting individuals and, that find themselves homeless, that is part of our portfolio. And right now the Housing Resource Centre, which is uh, operated through the Salvation Army, is the primary uh, organization that is working to facilitate and support individuals uh, who are homeless. That is also done in collaboration with uh, various city departments um, through our encampment network. Um, so there's a number of city uh, departments involved in that encampment network, helping to support uh, and facilitate the movement um, of those individuals. Okay, it's just, it appears that the, uh, the same group is always in the same places downtown. And I, I'm just wondering how, uh, how, are, how are we reaching out to them? They're obviously still there and continue to still be there. Um, I, I just don't know um, visibly what, what, what's being done. It, it just appears nothing's being done to the local person that just looks and says, that fellow was there two weeks ago, he's there today and he'll probably be there two months from now. Uh, how, how do we deal with that or how are we dealing with that? Thank you through the chair. So I can appreciate that. And that is something we're evaluating right now. So the HR3, HRC through their um, outreach visits, the, has a route that they visit each day um, with their regular locations and they do outreach. Um, and the hope is to support those peoples towards finding housing. The challenge and the barrier is sometimes people don't want to engage or connect with outreach at that time. So that is something we're working on right now um, and exploring other ways to facilitate movement. Um, but it is a very complex and challenging situation and staff appreciate that sometimes it appears that nothing is happening um, and that people circle back or go back to regular locations. Um, so I, unfortunately, I don't have a quick and easy answer, but to confirm that staff are working on this and the HRC uh, does have these locations as part of their regular outreach. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sless, 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 S
Um, we have Councillor McCree in the room and then we'll get to Councillor Miller. A chair, thank you very much. Um, Trisha, the, um, you, you alluded to um, the interaction that, that uh, our folks have with uh, some of the folks that live on the street. Could you, uh, could you offer a little clarity in terms of the messaging that, that those folks receive from our security people and from our social services staff? So for instance, there, there's a couple of folks with, um, with their portable uh, household across the street here when I came in this morning. So if we responded to that, how would our folks approach them and what would be said? Thank you uh, through the chair. So um, I actually engaged with those individuals this morning. So the first conversation was, uh, good morning, um, are you okay? Um, how can we support you? And essentially finding out why they found themselves there this, in the morning. And uh, those individuals were on their way to an appointment. Um, so they were provided with resources. So um, part of it was having a conversation around how did you find yourselves here? Um, how can we facilitate moving you to an appropriate location? Um, in this instance, they needed help towards rental accommodation. So they were provided, I provided them with information, um, identified where they could go for those supports. And then the next step would be helping to facilitate, connect them to whether it's first or month, last month's rent, um, finding other listings. So that is the connection that is made. Um, in other instances, it, it really depends on the situation. But I want to be clear that um, people are provided options to move and not stay in an encampment uh, situation. That is, that is the bottom line to facilitating movement um, and not uh, uh, allowing for folks to stay in one location. It's offering places with shelter. Uh, and in fact, if if if, um, if I may, I, I believe CEO Hutchings has an answer as well. Just I jump into Councillor McCurry's question, uh, Trisha. You may have weren't around in 2019. There actually isn't a report. So Councillor McCurry, uh, if you remember the situation in 2019, we brought back a flow chart exactly how we would deal with these individuals. Um, and the HRC reference that the outreach workers go and meet with them on two or two occasions. Bylaw then becomes involved, and then uh, then. HRC gets more involved. We have the BDOT team as well. And then last but not least, we get the police involved. They're the last measure and the police won't come until we can show them we've had all kinds of different exercises. So there is a there is a, a flow chart. It's not in front of me right now, but there's a flow chart we developed a few years ago, which council looked at twice and we brought it back twice. So the, the occupation of a public space um, is a trespass, I believe, is that correct? There's, in our, in our public spaces, yes, there's some questions on some of the sidewalks, but on the other properties, yes, uh, it's deemed as a trespass. We have a bit slower response when there's a private property query because we have to reach out. But to I, I don't very much that any of those folks have the ownership papers or the pig slips for the grocery carts, right? I can't, I can't respond. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Fair enough. I'll, I'll answer my own question. That would be a no. I think it was a rhetorical thanks, question thanks, anyway. Thanks very much for that. Okay, thank you, Councillor McCreary. Um, moving on to Councillor Miller, and then I'll ask for second speakers. Councillor Miller, you have four minutes. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions, um, one, one to staff. Um, they talk about partnerships, uh, integrating better with other community organizations. I think everybody around this table is, is in, in favor of that. I know I am, I think it's great. I've talked about it before, um, but we don't. We want integration, but we don't want duplication. So I guess um, in the report, they talked about, you know, just for example, working with other services such as the health unit or the OHT, or I think even long-term care was in there somewhere and so forth. So how, how do we integrate without making sure we don't actually duplicate what other organizations are doing? How does staff, how does staff make sure we don't do that? So through the chair, that's a great question and it is a challenge that we face all the time. Um, so we sit at many tables, we have lots of collaboration and that discussion is had fairly regularly. Um, so we appreciate where the gaps are um, through needs assessments and then where there's duplication. Um, we try to work through that and um, actually enhance services and remove the duplication. Um, but it's a fair question and um, there are many service providers and partners 
both in the social services realm and in the health realm that um, have good intentions are doing great work um, in trying to support um, individuals and families within our communities. Um, so we do continuously have those conversations uh, to work towards efficiencies and avoid duplication. If I could just jump in there too, Councillor Miller, the whole basis behind this whole, when we did a reorganization and put recreation services in with social services to create a community service department, so we went from rec services to social service and create a community services, was the fact that when I started, our rec services staff weren't working with social services staff, and probably 75% of those children they were working with and mothers they were working with and rec services were social services client. We limited a whole commission and also uh, reduce duplication right away internally. And now we work with our external partners. So that was a big part of it. And that's what we're, we're trying to do. And other cities such as Toronto and Hamilton have done the same thing where the rec services are totally integrated with their community service, with their social services. Okay, I appreciate the answers. Um, I, I appreciate the talk about gaps, needs assessment. <laughs> as long as staff's aware, um, because yeah, you, you get duplication and then you get groups competing in, in, in that never ends well. Last question I have, and I don't want an answer, but this is to our chair um, because he was part of it for the county. We have a community uh, well-being and safety plan, and I'll ask him at our council at the end of the month to give him some time to think about it. But I'm just wondering how this uh, vision plan fits in with our community well-being and safety plan. So I'll leave that as an open-ended question, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'll ask you again uh, at the end of this month, okay? <laughs> Thank thanks, thanks, thanks for the heads up. I, I got a month. Uh, and but the short answer is very well. It, it fits in very well. Um, okay. Any first-time speakers? Uh, Mayor Bailey, Councillor Vanderstel, or Councillor McAlpine? Uh, Councillor Vanderstel. Thank you, Chair Leferriere. I, I think I jumped the queue in front of Councillor and Tosker. At least I feel that way anyway. I <laughs> um, yeah, uh, one of the questions that comes to me on a frequent basis is, um, you know. Uh, very much along the same lines of what we've heard so far. Um, you know, there, there's somebody camped out in front of Tim Hortons and, um, you know, they're, they've been there for a while and what are we doing about it? And what are they doing about it? And, and how do we stop that kind of behavior from happening? So <clears throat> my answers normally are um, something to the effect of um, there are services available. City of Brantford, County of Brant um, stands um, to, um, to, to, to be in a position and always be in a position to hold a hand out. And when you do need help, um, we're waiting, we're ready. We have multiple programs in place uh, to make sure that you have a, a softer place to land and the community supports you need to make a better life. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the question again. I, I know I've asked it a number of times, Marlene, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the term, in the middle of this term, and now, uh, regardless of what season it is, do we have capacity in our shelter system? Do we have room for people if they do want to take that step up or that next step? Um, have we always had capacity in our shelter system, in our service system? Thank you, through the chair. So the short answer is yes, we have capacity in the system um, to accommodate those uh, seeking shelter. The next part of the answer is, is the existing shelter system reflective of the needs of the community now? Um, so those are things that we're currently exploring, um, which were referenced in part in the other report uh, that was uh, approved earlier, so the Housing Stability Services and Reaching Home Update. So there is capacity in the system. What we're seeing is that what we have isn't reflective of the need, and we're also experiencing um, coming out of the pandemic and COVID, the enormous, enormous change on what's needed uh, in, in the community. So those are things we're examining in detail with our stakeholders um, and shelter system colleagues. Thanks, Trish. Um, I, I've been to many other Southern Ontario communities and there's very much the same struggles in almost every community. So would you venture a guess that somehow all of those communities 
their shelter system, their support systems isn't as we are finally or well enough tuned to the needs of the people who are in that position so that this is an almost insurmountable problem based on the question of willpower or based on the question of uh, political willpower or availability of services because it seems to be consistent right across the country. Thank you through the chair. That's a big question. Um, I know having met with the 47 leads uh, service manager areas over the past uh, few weeks, these are consistent challenges across the province, most definitely. Um, different service managers are implementing different um, solutions or reactions. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question, but it is a huge issue that many other jurisdictions are struggling with um, and working towards functional zero. That, that's time. Um, but you do have an opportunity for a second. I'll, I'll just state quickly because it, it's it's ur urbane, <laughs> excuse the pun. But if you look at 5.4, um, we have more shelter spaces in Brantford Brant per urban population than the other comparators in that in that space. So I think that might help answer your question a little bit in terms of, yes, the problems everywhere, which is in that report as well, but we actually have more shelter spaces per urban population than those folks do. Um, so one more time for either uh, Councillor McAlpine or Mayor Bailey. Nope. Okay, so we go to second speakers. I have to go in the room first, Cheryl. I, you weren't you weren't overlooked, as Councillor Vanderstelt might have hinted at over there. You weren't cut in line. But Councillor Wall, you have your hand up in the room? And then Mayor Davis, anybody else in the room? Okay, so we'll go with Councillor Wall, then Mayor Davis, then Councillor Antoski. So it's always a good time here at Social Services. Thank you guys for all the hard work that you're doing, uh, seriously. And I know that this report and the presentation, it is what it is, it's a 10-year plan. And uh, we can go deep into every single thing that we're doing. I can ask a question. I think I know what the answer is, and I just, is there a city of a comparable size to Brantford anywhere that you can think of that doesn't have the same kind of societal issues that we are facing in our downtown? And if the answer is anything other than, like, sorry, uh, yes, what are they doing? And I guess in this 10-year plan, like, what is the next step? What, what, is, what are we missing or what don't we have? And not because you don't want to do it but either because there's not funding to do it or because it's not practical to do, or like, what is the best practice? What are cities in the world doing to not have people camping out and showering uh, or urinating or having open drug use on the street? Like, I know that that's a really difficult question to answer, but it's very topical because we are constantly getting asked about these issues and is there any city that's figured out a way to fix this? Or not fix it, but do it different? So I'll start and I'll turn it over to Trisha again. So the answer would be no, there isn't a, com a comparable city or a city I would suggest that um, has figured out um, how to support or better support um, those that need the support. So we're continually doing um, jurisdictional scans. We're continually working with our 47 leads, uh, working with the province and the feds, um, taking funding and doing many, many different strategies um, to support the population. Um, but um, there is no um, there is no magic wand um, to support or to um, you know, remove um, the challenges that we're facing today. And we're not just facing, facing them provincially, we're facing them nationally and broader. Um, it's a, a broad problem. The pandemic has made the situation worse, as you mm -hmm. can all appreciate, um, than the numbers of addictions and mental health and um, that we're struggling with. Um, it really does speak to the need for partnerships and collaboration, um, which is within our plan. And it, it'll be critical uh, to move um, this forward uh, to support those in need. But I'll just ask Trisha if she wants to add anything. Thank you through the chair. Uh, also on the call is Anthony Dolcetti, our manager of housing stability. He might have some additional context based on the work and research that uh, the team is currently doing. But um, the answer is no, there, there isn't a magical solution. We do know there's communities across the country that have experienced functional zero. So that is applying um, where 
um, there is sufficient space to accommodate those experiencing homelessness and a plan is put in place to do that. And to do that, that inc includes a lot of collaboration, um, some funding, and then the creation of uh, housing options, which we are all doing. We, we are working towards that, working very hard towards that. Um, I think what's happened now is this, this pandemic has created a new situation that we're adjusting to. And so we need to readjust and figure out what is the appropriate response now. Um, but what we are working towards uh, through reaching home and the programming that we do is we're working very hard towards a functional zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Davis. Yeah, the this the solution to this problem, and it's it's not unique. I talked to other mayors; uh, they're all experiencing the same thing. In some other communities, it's actually quite worse. But um, the solution lies in uh, better collaboration <clears throat> with the province. Uh, for example, think back two months. Didn't we have some delegations, delegates, some individuals that came to us from Marlene Ave, and they were people who had previously been on the street. Who had been had been begging and had substance use issues, and they talked about the opportunity to go to Marlene Ave came up. They they took it because they were sick of their lifestyle, and that all the support services and programs at Marlene Ave has changed their lives. And but that's a very expensive program. It depends completely and entirely upon provincial government funding, and besides being a well-managed program, if you get the funding. <clears throat> the other issue in terms of people being on the street, you, the, we can't create laws here at the city that uh, makes it illegal and somehow has them, quote, shipped away. You can't do that. And that's, that's because the laws that apply on the street are those that are provided by the province for the Petty Trespass Act, which if the person's not engaging in criminal conduct, it's a $100 fine. And... Um, uh, doesn't do much to uh, as a disincentive plus my experience talking to people on the street some of them have very serious mental health issues that would not be amenable to daytime treatment and probably require residential treatment and thus there's a need to look at the mental health act to determine uh, if the if the pendulum swung too far uh, against residential care uh, which in some cases is the only way you can treat some of the very serious chronic mental health issues. So all of that speaks to a need for greater coordination uh, with the province and other municipalities. And in fact, that was an issue at the latest on meeting of the Ontario Big City Mayor's <coughs> Caucus. And there was a resolution passed unanimously asking the province and the premier and several of, of his ministers, Minister of Health, Minister uh, Tobolo, now uh, the Associate Minister of Health, to meet in a in a um, on sort of a crisis basis with the mayors of the big cities to determine what can be done moving forward in terms of greater provincial resources for the types of programs that are proving successful, and considering a review of some of the provincial laws that would uh, be, allow for a better management of the issue on the street. Uh, the other issue, so that's hopefully going to be happening. The other issue locally downtown is that uh, one of the objectives of the Downtown Improvement Task Force was having a more consistent policing presence, which has not been in our downtown for some years. And in fact, in January, we advanced the decision, the funding decision, and the council decided, city council decided unanimously to fund that. Um, and that decision was made early January. We heard last night at city council from the city CAO that the police services expects to have that beat patrol in place sometime in August. And that'll also have an impact uh, downtown to have a consistent policing presence that currently we don't have. So there are things that are happening this summer that I think will help address the situation, but it's, it's a very ingrained problem of, of that does require better cooperation and collaboration with the province, and hopefully that will be forthcoming. I mean, there have been various initiatives, like the Supportive Housing Initiative, the province uh, primarily funds, and obviously we need to see an extension uh, of that particular program across the province. So um, 
there are things happening that I think sh should give a reason for hope and optimism that over time we can uh, better manage this issue and provide better assistance that really helps those who have the serious issues that have them ending up on the street. Thank you, and Thank you. Uh, that is time. Um, Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would tend to agree with the mayor, um, but my question, I guess, goes a little bit higher. If there, if indeed, the last number that I heard, if, I don't know sure if it's correct or not, but 380,000 people in Canada um, are experiencing, uh, is that me? Um, are exp experiencing um, <clears throat> a number of levels of, of being unhoused. Um, is it not also a national strategy that needs to be developed or redeveloped? I mean, um, it, it's something that I, I don't think any, as we've heard, municipality can walk away from easily. Um, it, it may not just be restricted to provincial funding for Ontario. Um, maybe it's a question of uh, an enhanced or an enriched approach from the federal government on um, how we manage, you know, that 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 river, essentially a river of pain and trauma that's been flowing through our urban centers right across the country. Um, how many times have we made a, a, a very clear and over gesture toward the federal government to enhance their programs? Has that happened in this in this term? Or is there something that this council could do or our councils could do um, to enhance that, uh, that better working relationship between the federal government and those who are almost permanently unhoused? Um, thank you, through the chair. So federally, there's, um, there is an, a national housing strategy, um, and then the reaching home funding is federal funding. So there, there is things happening federally. Um, some of the challenges are, for example, with some of the national ha housing strategy and the funding is the complications of applying for funding or even achieving any of the funding is quite complicated. So at a staff level, we continue those dialogues because where there's opportunity to get funding, it takes so long that by the time they get to the end, the development proposal is sort of fallen apart. So um, at a staff level, there definitely is ongoing dialogue around um, better accessing existing programs. Um, but I will turn to Anthony Dolcetti, who hopefully is online to speak to um, the reaching home a little bit more at a federal level. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tricia. Uh, and through the chair, um, as Tricia was describing, um, <clears throat> the city is currently part of the federal reaching home program um, as referenced in um, report 5.4 of the agenda. Um, up until really last year, um, that program was providing um, some much needed funding in terms of um, you know, beefing up the housing stability uh, portfolio and some positions within the city. But it wasn't really until last year and, and up until I get or into this year and, and next year that uh, that program has really started to provide additional uh, funding that are we're trying to make a difference with. And I think that back to um, Councillor uh, Councillor Vanderstelt's question in regards to the number of shelter beds that we have in the system and the capacity that we're seeing and the percentages, what we're trying to do really with that funding right now is look to some longer term solutions on housing stability and homeless prevention. So just for, I guess, your interest right now, um, Currently, as of today, we have 330 people on the city's by name list. So that that list is really a quick snapshot of who we um, are seeing as our current homeless population. So out of those 330 people, um, we have about 116 individuals who within the last two years have returned from permanent housing into homelessness. So obviously, with inflation, rising uh, costs and rent, uh, obviously the pandemic, we're seeing, um, uh, and much like other municipalities and communities, we're, we're seeing that a, a lot more folks are returning uh, from permanent housing into homelessness. So um, included in that report, uh, the Reaching Home and the Housing Stability Update Report, we had decided to um, take some of that additional incremental Reaching Home funding 
and put that towards additional housing stability work. Um, and I'll leave it at that if there's any further questions for me. Thank you. That's actually past time, but just out of respect for the answer, I wanted to let you finish. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, we'll go to Cheryl, but before we do, I just want to mention too that, I mean, the federal government had a minister of public housing for uh, quite a long time. They now have a minister of housing again, but only since I believe 2021. So I think it's going to take a long time to get that train rolling at the same speed it used to. Uh, but also, I, just to mention, some provinces do have a minister of addiction and uh, mental health and addiction, and that's uh, a direction I, I bet that this um, table would support uh, our province going towards as well. Um, so uh, she's been waiting a long time, but Councillor Antoski, your second go at speaking, and uh, you have four minutes starting now. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Through you to staff, I have a, a few questions, uh, just because some of it's been alluded to here today. Um, so one of the challenges that I know we face is, is people in distress, you know, obviously having the choice to not take the help. Um, Trisha, you're aware of the situation we're dealing with. And at what point is there a pivot point? I understand the compassion toward really trying to find the help, find the right resources, make sure that this person is, is adequately um, um, supported. But if, if the person continues to refuse services, at what point do we step in for, because this is in a residential area and you've got two things going, sometimes because there's mental illness, sometimes there's some aggression towards the residents, which becomes a police matter. Other times it's, it's just living rough. But at what point do we step in and I don't know what it is we do um, to remove the problem from the residents? Uh, thank you. And through the chair. So um, in that particular situation is a challenging one for sure. Um, so there is the protocol that we follow that has not changed um, from years past for the um, uh, encampment network or homeless network. And we do follow that protocol. Um, in working with individuals, um, sometimes it's not a straight line. But what I would like to do is ask, ask Anthony Dolcetti to give a deeper explanation of the process and uh, what happens when um, individuals are not engaging and, and we hit those barriers. Thank you. Can I ask just one more question before Anthony answers, because he might have some of the answers to this as well. Um, do we still, and I don't know what we call it, we used to call it the crisis table. Does that still exist as the multi-agency um, uh, support system? And if so, do we have staff sitting at that? Because this would be a situation I think that would be dealt with that. Um, thank you through the chair. Yes, we do. I recently connected with them and we, uh, we that is the plan. Um, in that one particular situation. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> Thanks, Trish, and through the chair to Councillor Antoski. Um, yes, yeah, so understandably, um, as Trish has alluded to, some folks that we come across um, during our encampment outreach do not necessarily want uh, the assistance um, from social services or, or anyone within our system of care. Uh, it obviously presents a challenge and, and you know, we understand that constituents uh, don't want folks um, sleeping, you know, on property, on the streets and things like that. So really right now, um, when that notification comes in, we ask our outreach teams, whether that be BDOT or the HRC outreach team to attend that site within 24 hours. Um, if there's no active, meaningful engagement with that individual, couple, whoever that may, may be, um, that will be flagged for then a um, response from bylaw. Um, fo really following outreach, um, if there is no uh, meaningful engagement, like I, like I said, bylaw will go and ask that individual or provide them notice that they will have to move along. Now, ultimately, and I think that uh, Councillor Sless has had said this earlier, is that what we're seeing a lot of the times, it is those same group of folks um, that really just do not want to engage with services. And it presents a very, very big challenge um, for not only, you know, bylaw or, or outreach, but um, other members uh, who are part of our um, encampment response as well. Ultimately, um, 
you know, if, if we do get that pushback or aggression, we will have to work with police services in some situations um, where they will have to um, remove that individual or, or couple from that location. Um, Anthony, I'm sorry, you're at, you're at time there. Sure, go ahead. Question. Um, any other second time speakers? Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a minute. Anthony, do you wanna finish your uh, response to Councilor Antosky? I can, I can use the privilege to do that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you through the chair. Um, so basically what I was stating is, is we understand that um, it, it's a coordinated effort to, um, to serve these, the, the hardest to serve right now. And um, it's no different than what, you know, what's taking place, unfortunately, in other municipalities where um, we're seeing, um, we all deal with encampments right now. And um, it's, it is a coordinated effort and we're, we're still just fine tuning that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I also tend to wonder, this is just discussion, but I, I tend to wonder that because of the, the other part of the housing crisis, which is about housing affordability and skyrocketing prices, I think a lot of resources are going towards helping folks who are not in the crisis priority um, because you know they are a big part of the population, they vote, the, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we sometimes at bigger levels of government um, we're moving funds that maybe in the past would have gone to public housing and to some of these like dire crises are going to soften the blow for middle income earners, um, which is important too. But it's, it's, uh, it's interesting as, as things get tighter and harder for the, the middle group of, of any area or any country, you have uh, issues that will trickle down, um, not to overuse a phrase, but... Okay, uh, with the discussion concluded for that, what we'll do is we will call the vote on 5.1. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, opposed, if any? I think Councillor Antosky, you were in favor? Just got there a little late? Okay, so that passes unanimously. Okay, we're moving to 5.3, the Municipal Affordable Housing Development Incentives Update. Um, I know Councillor Miller had a question about this. Does anybody in the room have a question about this? Councillor Miller, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just very briefly on page 15 of the report. That's what you said about the last 15. one. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, yeah. That's what you said about the last one. <laughs> well, I was quick. Um, <laughs> anyway, that, that was good discussion. Yeah, that's so I should say that because I, 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 I appreciate hearing all the different uh, opinions and things, whatnot, comments. Um, page 52 of our packet, page 15 of the report, in the conclusion, talks about how the city of Brantford is investing municipal funding and, for example, proceeds from the sale of assets. I should also point out um, the county has been doing the same with the sale of our municipal properties. If the uh, funds aren't spoken for, um, we are putting them in our affordable housing reserve. And uh, Mr. Chair, you should know that well because you were the one that uh, brought that motion forward. So I didn't see that in the report, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Any comment from staff? Can we add that to a, to a report in the future? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Also, uh, I discussed with uh, in the pre-meeting for this meeting um, that the, the city uh, does an automatic waiving of developmental charges, and I believe the county our our process is at current time is that the, an application has to happen for each individual piece. But um, that's something we should look at on the county level too. And I think we are about maybe making that process more automatic, uh, so developers know that if they're doing affordable or public housing, that they will definitely get uh, some portion, if not all, developmental charges push but I have a sense that our council in the county if, if applications were to come forward for that very very supportive of waiving those developmental charges um, so that's something just keep in mind that uh, isn't fully fleshed out in the report but is still accurate any other questions or comments on this one seeing none I'll call the vote all those in favor and that carries and then uh, finally uh, 5.5 uh, building our community from the kids up uh, early on update. Um, I know Councillor Miller had a question about this one. Does anybody in the room have one first? Councillor Miller, go for it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so looking at the single source contract with Six Nations for Indigenous early on, um, I did not read in the report and maybe I'm missing it, but uh, how long is this contract for? Is it open-ended? Yeah, through the chair, Aaron Wallace, director of community programs. This would be an open-ended contract. Both parties would have the right within the contract to terminate based on the notice provision, but this would be an ongoing contract. Okay, I suspect as much, but like I said, I did not see that report. So, okay, thank you for the answer. 
Okay, thank you. So seeing uh, no further discussion on this, I'd like to call the vote. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously as well. Uh, we have one consent item that the minutes for the June 8th, 20, oh, pardon me. They were carried in the omnibus motion. <laughs> of course they were. I, uh, sorry, a procedural issue from my end. No resolutions, no notices of motion. Um, before we adjourn, I'd just like to say it was a great conversation, great discussion, great responses from a multitude of staff. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, four minutes on complex issues is always difficult. Uh, so well done to all involved. Um, on the note on adjournment, uh, I believe uh, this um, group does not sit in August. So our next and last of this term meeting of this group will be in September. September 7th. September 7th. Okay. So I will, uh, with that in mind, mind I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.